Kitchen event, a partnership between Preserving with Purpose and the Clearview Library District. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We're so happy that you're here and so excited to get this interview started. Um, a little bit before we do that, just kind of want to introduce myself and let you guys know a little bit about um, just the upcoming events and um, some etiquette things for tonight's interview and um, we'll get started then. So, so as far as the Capturing a Generation event, it has been a um, individual interviews that we capture the stories, the history, and the wisdom from those who've lived in the town of Windsor, Severance, and West Greeley and their um, memories of living here and walking them down memory lane. And so you all get a piece of that information and learning through the lives that they live. So it's a pretty exciting event that we're doing. Um, my name is Claire Rich Richardson. Um, I do know my name, Claire Rich Richardson, with Preserving with Purpose. And we capture the life stories of individuals on video in order to preserve their history, stories, and memories for future generations. Um, our Capturing a Generation series will continue next week with our last and final interview with Dennis Kane. That's October 1st at 6.30 p.m. Um, you can go to the Clearview uh, District or Library District and sign up for that event. If you click on their calendar and go to that October 1st date, you will see that event at the 6.30 time slot. So we hope that you'll join us for that one. Um, he has a lot of information about the town of Severance and Windsor combined, which is pretty awesome. So, um, if you all do have any questions for um, Miss Kathy, I encourage you guys to definitely put those in the chat room as we go along with tonight's interview, and I will make sure to answer or ask those to her at the end of this interview and um, get those all squared away for everybody as we go. So um, thank you for doing that. And um, without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce Kathy, T um, Kathy Rickert from Tigus Farms, and um, she's here joining us tonight to talk about her story in West Greeley and Windsor and um, her family farm. So thank you so much, Kathy, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, you're welcome. Well, let's get started. Um, you've got such an interesting background and I wanted to fi find out and, and have you expand on how your family came to reside in Colorado. Well, the short story is that on the Tigas side, my grandfather and his brother, my grandfather was around 19 years old and my, his brother Ed was 16. And they got itchy feet. They were in Peterson, Iowa, and they wanted to see the West. So they took off and they roamed around from 1889 to 1904. And they worked at farms all over, shearing sheep and building um, dams and just doing everything, stacking hay, anything they could find. Um, they traveled to Park City, and I'm going to read this little part so I get the places right. And they went to Park City, Montana, Spokane, Washington, and then Seattle, Oregon, San Francisco, California, and then to Elko, Nevada, Salt Lake City, Utah, Manitou Springs, now we're finally in Colorado. And then they went to Denver, and finally they went to Greeley. When they got to Greeley, my grandpa, Tigus, Philip Tigus, said, you know what, I'm gonna find a job with an older farmer that has a daughter. And he did. And he met Lucy Wadlin, and that was the end of the story as far as my paternal side, the Tigas side, coming to Colorado in this area. On the maternal side, my mom was a Lind, and they uh, and my grandpa Lind, or my mom, mom was mother's grandmother was a Mary Frank, and uh, my grandpa was William Lind. They were Germans from Russia. And as you know, the community had a lot of local Germans here. Well, grandma's parents got to the dock late and the ship had already left. And they came over on a Spanish freighter that really wasn't seaworthy. And so they got here and then they traveled by train the rest of the way to get to Galveston, Texas, and then to Windsor. 
Grandpa was 10, his brother was 12, their parents also left, they came over on a ship, and the, when they got here, Grandpa and his brother had an eye disease, and so they wouldn't let him in on Ellis Island. So parents went on to Windsor, and those two boys went back to Germany on their own. They said they cried many times just sitting and huddling each other on the ship. The parents gave the sailors money to make sure the boys got back and got back to America. And the sailors took care of them, but when they got to Germany, they didn't, didn't heal, spend the money for the eye disease. The boys healed anyway. They spent the money for sailor uniforms for the boys. When they came back, then the boys just walked through immigration freely because they thought they were just uh, German sailors. And so they walked freely in and then they got, the sailors made sure they got on the train and the right one to get to Galveston, Texas. And then the funny part of it was grandpa, when he got there, he said the three words that he knew in English, Ditch ve Windsor. So, yeah, the V's, Vich, Ve, Windsor. And that was the only English words that he knew. And so Grandma, when she was here, Grandpa, her dad wanted to go back to uh, Germany someday. Never did, but Grandma, when she put her feet on American soil, she said, I'll never leave America. So that's how they got to Colorado and was part of the vocal Germans from Russia. That's uh, an incredible story. And do you know, did they want to end up in Colorado, in a part of Colorado? They what? Do you know if they wanted to end up in Colorado? I think uh, Windsor was kind of a destination for many of the Volga Germans because of the sugar factory. And so that was just where a lot of them were headed um, when they came to America. But I don't know why specifically or for sure. Yeah, yeah. What did your parents do for a living and how did that impact your future? Well, mom and dad were farmers and um, dad was a CSU graduate and he had majored in agronomy, had job offers, I, even now across in Europe and other places, but he decided he wanted to continue farming and keep the farm going. And so he stayed at home and farmed with his dad and eventually um, became the owner of the farm, the second generation owner. But uh, a farmer is what he was. And my mother was what I call a farm partner, not just a farm wife, but a farm partner, because it takes a partner. Um, and to be able to be a successful farmer, which they were successful farmers. And they led the 4-H clubs and uh, both of them were 4-H leaders. They taught so many kids in the neighborhood and all around and all of us so many, many skills through our 4-H projects. So that was how they impacted us the most, as well as just enjoying living in the country. Yeah. What did your family grow and contribute to the community by what they grew? All right, they grew uh, dead. The farm, when grandpa had it, was, had a lot of potatoes. And uh, also grandpa Tigas was very instrumental in uh, starting the ditches so that we had ditches and water to this area and without the water there would not be the productive farms that we have. So he was very interest, uh, instrumental on that. My dad also was very instrumental and was on the ditch board and was uh, the president of that for quite a few years. My brother has also continued as a president of that as well. But um, the, they also grew sugar beets, uh, corn, alfalfa, and uh, they had, dad had a dairy farm as well. So they were milk cows. And of course, all of those go out to the community in, in various ways. Sure, 
Sure, that's amazing. So what was the name of your community? Because I know you were kind of a little bit outside of Windsor. So did it have its own name? Yes, and it still has. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's the Bracewell community. And it is still the Bracewell community. Although at that time, the Bracewell community was centered around the school uh, and the, there was a country store on the corner of uh, what we have now, 27 and 64 and a half, that corner. It was a country store, it was a gas station, and then inside, uh, just anything that you needed, like a little convenience store. And there was candy for us kids, and, <laughs> and we just, it was a great little place to hang out. Um, we also learned lessons there because my uncle Dan was the one that owned it and my aunt Minna. And um, uncle Dan kept an eye on all of us kids and we used to uh, bet each other whether we could sneak out a candy bar without uncle Can Dan seeing us. But uncle Dan just always kept all of his records up on a little sheet of paper right there and Eventually, he would ask each one of us when we were going to pay our bill. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we kind of just stammer and stutter, and he says, but you can work. So I think every kid in the community learned their honesty lesson and not to steal because every one of us got to dust shelves. <laughs> you had to pay off those candy bars. Right, we had to pay off. So we had to dust shelves. We dusted cans and, uh, you know, everything. So, yeah. But that was the community, the Bracewell, and there was the Bracewell School community uh, that, with their activities. But do you, do you know how many people were in that community? Oh, goodness. I, mm, there is... Well, no, I don't, but there were just farm families all around. And, uh, and usually there were uh, three, four kids in the family. So, yeah. yeah. What did your day look like as a farm kid, quote unquote farm kid? Well, the, um, as a farm kid, um, the first thing in the morning was chores. And I, when I was uh, growing up, it, as a teenager, I'm sure my dad probably used this as a way to keep the guys away because I always got the job to clean the milk barn and I had to clean it before I went to school. And so <laughs> I probably smelled like the milk barn, but uh, hopefully not. <laughs> and uh, we had rabbits, we had 4-H projects, we had beef, we had pigs, uh, there were sheep, there were chickens, and of course everything needed to be fed in the morning and the evening. And if they were 4-H projects, we also had to train them so we could show them later at the county fair. And then there was always just help. Um, I, small as I was, helped my dad with bales of alfalfa and we stacked them up. And uh, the dairy cows had to, we had to take the pitchfork and feed them in the bunk. And they've got their share of alfalfa. Um, I think that not everybody got to lay on a haystack to watch for Sputnik, and, but I did and with my dad, and I still remember being on top of the haystack and watching the sky and seeing that uh, event. But um, we, we always just had a lot of things to do and had a lot of things that we played, did as well. You, um, do you feel that you differed from a lot of the Windsor kids? I mean, what, I, I know that it was kind of a agriculture farming community, but did you feel that you fit in with a lot of the Windsor kids or how did you guys differ? They were town kids and we were country kids. And um, the town kids went to school for eight years before we ever entered their lives. Um, so they pretty much had their little cliques and groups and they were hard to break and um, many of us didn't break it and I know on our 50th uh, reunion of our class one of the guys that was there on the planning committee too was a country kid and from a different area around the Severance area and he just said to him hey so you guys 
looked at the town kids that were on this committee now 50 years later and said, you guys were really hard on us. And they looked at us and they're like, what? And I said, yeah, you were hard on us. And they, we were country kids and we were kind of treated a little bit like Hicks and um, they were city kids. And so there was a difference, but there was also a cultural difference in the community in that um, there were a lot of kids that were from the German, from uh, Russia families. And there were some kids that I learned even at our 50th reunion that couldn't even speak English while they were in school in elementary grades. And I know one of my classmates helped another one that um, an older or young or a boy that to learn English by sitting down and reading children's books with him. And so they read storybooks together and that's how he learned English. And I didn't know that till our 50th uh, reunion because I was out in the country and wasn't in town where there were a lot of the German speaking people. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Yeah. And you went to you went to that more Bracewell community school, is that right? We went to the Bracewell school. Yes, it was a community school. And that differed from the Windsor schools. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Way different. Um, my class, I there were four boys and me. I didn't have a girl in my class. And that was for 8 years. I'm sure the Windsor were Classes were much bigger, 50, you know, some kids, and yeah. very small compared to now, but uh, then very large compared to what we were. And we were just a three-room schoolhouse, and it was a brick building. There's a big doors on the west side and big doors on the east side, and if you opened them up both, you saw all the way down the hallway, out the other side. And... Um, then we also had the um, one side was the first and second grade. There was no kindergarten. First and second grade was in one room with one teacher. And then second, our third, fourth, and fifth were in what we called the middle room on one side of the building. And then on the other side was, of course, the elite, the big room, and had the big kids, the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And that room also had a stage. And I think some of you kind of may remember on some of the movies where the old stage curtain would roll down and had all the advertisements on it. That was our stage curtain. It was just like that. Oh. That curtain is still in our community. Um, it, we, it is preserved and it is in the Bracewell community. Um, hopefully someday there will be a museum that they can go into. But we, had you know the three grade three rooms three teachers and they taught all those grades the three teachers and the schoolhouse was brick on the outside and it had a cement ledge that went all the way around the school and recess we would clamber up on that ledge and then put our arms way back so that we were just flat against the brick and see if we could walk all the way around the schoolhouse. So um, we also had um, baseball was what our activity was. Yeah. And we played games with the other ones. Now, little ones like me, I never did get very big. Um, I got to just chase the missed balls or the wild pitches, but at least I got to do that. And, uh, but we had, it was, it was a great school. Um, the bathroom was not exactly the greatest. It was, there were two outhouses, one for the boys and one for the girls. In the wintertime, it was really cold because you had to get clear across the play yard to the outhouse. So it was a quite a jaunt, cold one, and it wasn't really very warm in there. And uh, <laughs> so that wasn't exactly the most pleasant experience, but that's yeah. what it was. We didn't have it, any bathrooms inside. So we had to take our lunches. There's no cafeteria. So we always had to pack lunches. So maybe sandwiches aren't my favorite things. <laughs> 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 yeah, I could see why for sure. Yeah. yeah.
I know, um, and I, I want to do this because Tom did ask a question about how high the ledge was for you guys. How, how high the what? The ledge was. Oh, you... I'd say the ledge was probably about uh, three feet off from, uh, from up above the ground. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't real high. It wasn't real dangerous or anything. So, and then we used to walk the metal um, fence. Like it was just a pipe, two pipes, and as far as the fence in front on where the road was, as far as, and we used to walk on that. And it, it was really hard to walk on because it was round. And then it would also be very slick if it was even any kind of moisture. <laughs> and there were times, and I remember one time that I slipped and fell off and then hit my, the edge of your ear that is so tender right on the metal bar. That, that kind of rang for a while. <laughs> so, but yeah, he was just, in recess was, uh, they had, I, in fact, I brought it and forgot to bring it in. I had the bell and I have the bell from the school. Oh my God. And it, it was, it's just a metal bell and they, and it's loud and they just, ring it out the door and recess was over. So you just ring the bell. And Did you guys ever do activities with Windsor or go to Windsor to do activities or did you feel kind of more separated? We were separated. Yeah, we were more separated. Um, not even, we didn't even have a lot of the kids in town that were part of the 4-H clubs. Um, the 4-H clubs in t were in town or they were the country kids uh yeah. separate yeah what um i know when we had first talked to you one of some of the activities which i thought were very interesting was collecting some of the sugar beets can you talk a little bit about <laughs> that as activities yeah. that you guys did yeah um well the, the sugar beet uh, factory that was the thing that was here that brought many of the uh, people that lived in the community and the farmers grew sugar beets. And so when we come home from school, we were to help with the sugar beet harvest. And we would walk behind the harvester. And this, is, of course, there's a tractor. And then the uh, harvester would pull up the beets and throw them into this bin. But every once in a while, I'd miss a beet or two, you know. And so my dad fashioned a, a bench on the back of the bin. And so we would hop on that bench and ride it. And then if we'd see a beat, we'd hop off. And we had these big machete knives with a hook on the end. And so you will hook that beat, grab it by its tail and chop off the head and throw it in. And we did that when we were 10 years old. I can't imagine letting a kid have a machete now and doing that. But we never thought anything of it. And uh, my sister and I had brand new winter coats because beet harvest is cooler weather. And of course we got hot and she laid her brand new coat on that bench. Well, it went through the harvester and mom was not too very happy about a brand new winter coat going through the harvester and shredded. So that was one of the things that happened. But we would collect those beets and uh, take our wagons out and go up and down the dirt road um, it wasn't a busy speed road like it is now, but it was just a dirt quiet road. And um, we'd take our wagons out, we'd load up the beets and we made our own little beet pile, sugar beet pile. And so then dad would take that pile of sugar beets and he would come back and give us the money that we had earned for uh, our sugar beets that we collected. I'm sure that it was just money from dad's pocket because I'm sure they never weighed our beets separately. <laughs> so, um, but we thought he, we thought they were weighed and just like the big trucks. And yeah, yeah it was just a fun way for us to earn a little money. Yeah. Stay out of trouble. <laughs> so I know that you describe a lot of differences between the country kids and the town kids. So. Um, being in the country, did you guys go into town to go to the store? Or did you make and, and grow a lot of your own food, make your own clothes, any, anything like that? Well, part of our 4-H projects was we always did sewing and cooking. And, um, and as I said, I, I 
got to be the outdoor kid because I was the oldest in the family. I ended up doing a lot of things that maybe farmers would have their boys do. And then my sister was the one that helped mom a lot. And so as a result, I'm good at the outdoor activities and my sister's good at cooking. And, <laughs> and um, but we did, we can to preserved foods. We snapped green beans till we were just sick and tired of snapping green beans and <laughs> put up the tomatoes and anything that, that could be preserved uh, was preserved. And still at the farmhouse today, if you would go down in the basement into the uh, pantry room, there's, I probably two, 300 jars there at least um, that are not canned anymore, but empty. And um, my sister, she still cans the tomatoes and does that during the fall. I freeze the chilies for the family and they, she cans the tomatoes. But uh, yeah, we did. We did preserve, we learned to sew, we sewed our clothes. At that time, it was economical to sew clothes. Now, it costs more to, to make your own clothes than it does to buy them. Sure. So, sure. different time. Yeah. So where did you end up going um, to school after your eight years at the country school? Well, the country school eighth grade graduation was a big deal. Um, it, it was always uh, a huge event. And then from there, we went to high school and went to Windsor, to the high school. And that it was, the high school was what is now the middle school, okay. is where, where our high school was. And the first day that I got on the bus to go to high school, um, the bus driver stopped first at park school to let off all the elementary and grade school kids. And then he just kept looking at me in the mirror and he kept looking at me and looking at me. And finally he turned around and he said, well, aren't you going to get off? And I said, no, I get off at high school. Well, you got to realize I started high school weighing 50 pounds oh. and I was little. Yeah. And uh, so he slammed the door shut, looked ahead and he said, well, I'm not bringing you back. <laughs> so he went to high school and I got off at high school every day and he never did have to take me back to grade school. <laughs> How was high school for you? I mean, going in and being um, a little bit smaller than everybody and being a farm kid, what was your experience like? It was intimidating in, in ways and, um, but, and <laughs> The funny thing is that the, the shortest people always got the top lockers and we never got the bottom lockers that we could reach. We always got the top ones. So in a way that was kind of good because you could always ask the boys to help you yeah. get things out of your locker. <laughs> so that was all right. But I, and if they needed um, a kid in the play, in the high school play, well, you got to play the kid. Um, so, <laughs> and I know in one play, uh, that we had and I was supposed to be the kid sitting on the floor playing jacks with a um, ball and my jacks and I had this hat on and I threw the ball up and it didn't come down. <laughs> it was in my hat going around and around and around. <laughs> So, but as country kids, we, we sometimes got even with the town kids too. Um, one play, we had lockers on stage as part of our props. And since chickens were my 4-H project, um, there just so happened to be a couple of chickens in the lockers during the play. So it was really fun when they opened the locker and there was a chicken in there. <laughs> Did you get in trouble? No, no, but no, 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 no. <laughs> They still don't know it was you until now. Yeah. So, so at any rate, us country kids did do a few things too. So, so what was, I have to ask again, you know, um, coming from that three room school into Windsor High School, what was it like? Can you describe what the high school looked like and felt like to you? Well, the thing that was familiar is that there was one door on one end and one door on the other end and you look all the way down one hallway and that was the hallway the lockers were on so that was a little bit familiar thing uh that was there it was 
just that had a hallway. And um, otherwise, uh, the classrooms, there was upstairs, there was downstairs, and there was creaky stairs uh, going up and down the stairs um, to the classrooms. Um, the classes were larger. I had, um, I, being the oldest I, in the family, probably I was always trying to do the best that I could and pay attention and do things. And I did have one high school uh, friend or student that she kept asking me for my paper for one of the classes. And finally I told her, you can't have it. And then this, the German part came out because she hollered at me in German. I don't know what she said, but I don't think it was nice. And <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't let her have my paper anymore because I knew she was then copying it. Yeah. But the chemistry teacher took my notes too because he knew I outlined the chemistry class. And I did great in chemistry. I got straight A's because he taught from my outline. <laughs> so, oh my <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. But the, it was, what was really fun that I remember that I think is, sticks in my memory is um, the lights at the football game. It just, the night games and the football field was all lit up and that just seemed so awesome to me. And um, everybody cheering and just the enthusiasm at the football games. But out in the country, you might have, might have a yard light. Yeah. So it just seemed so grand and to be, have all of that, the field all lit up. I, and that I remember as being something that just is there and I can still see it. Yeah. yeah. Would your family all go into town for those football games or was it just you and your brothers and sisters? Mostly the family went in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, almost everything in the family, family did things together. So, yeah. Yeah. What other things would you guys come into town for, into Windsor for? Well, um, as far as into Windsor, mostly it would be supplies or things related to the farm. Um, we went to church in Greeley and Sunday school was in Greeley. But, um, and we also, one of the activities that we did uh, participate in beside 4-H was the roller rink. Warnoco roller rink and uh, we were in a lot of the uh, roller rink follies and performances that Jay Norcross did. Uh, I still, I have pictures of, um, and I had the horse that we had this one barrel that was made into a horse and uh, we all rode those horses that had a roller skater skate on the bottom and did a, a routine with that. But I competed um, in roller skating as well, did competition and uh, earned a couple of medals statewide. But we spent a lot of time and my parents, I don't know how they sat on those hard benches at the roller rink for the hours that they did so that we could participate in that activity. And it was a good wholesome activity. Where was that at? I did not know that there was a roller rink. Really, Warnoco Rink. Uh, it's close to Island Grove Park. Okay. And it was, yeah, um, it, it was an awesome rink. It was also, um, Glenn Miller played there uh, at that. It was like a dance hall, I think, first, then made into a roller rink, but the Glenn Miller band played there okay. years, years ago in the 40s. So. How long was that roller rink around for? Oh, goodness. Um, I would think, I'm trying to think. I think it was when we uh, came back, moved back to Colorado, my husband and I, in the 90s. Um, 90, 98, 99, after that, or maybe 2000, that the rink was sold and then it became an athletic uh, exercise place. And so it's not been around for quite some time. Okay. So, yeah. But I would really love it. We've tried to get a hold of Jay and see whether he had any of the old films of the roller rink follies. Uh, yeah. 
it would be awesome to be able to see those again. Yeah, definitely. Oh my gosh. What other things in Windsor uh, bring back memories for you? Okay. Um, I would say that uh, just the way that the Windsor looked as far as being so, so different than it is now. Um, Water Valley was a farm and one of my classmates lived there and she was considered a country kid. And that's, well, how small Windsor was is because we don't consider Water Valley as being so far away would be a farm anymore, you know, at all. It's just a part of the town. And so I'd say just the, the look of the town, I still um, remember the bells, Bethel's, Lutheran Church bells, uh, remembering them, hearing them at, at times when I was in town. And still, that's my church you now, but um, the bells always just are wonderful. So that is something that has been here, stayed here, still is here. Um, the buildings and what's in them have changed. The drugstores inside, uh, there was two drugstores, one, one on each side of the street, Main Street, and they had great fountains, uh, long fountains with the bench uh, with the little stools and you could get uh, limeade or uh, a nice fountain drink uh, made right there. And that, that's a good memory. Yeah. The, the one on the north side was kind of had a five and dime look too and that uh, they had low shelves and I can remember that they had glass partitions and then they would have little trinkets and things in each of the partitions. Just all those little tempting things and yeah. I have no idea what mom was in there for. I'm sure she was getting supplies of something but we wandered around and looked at all the little things and and wished we could do this or that or buy this or that yeah. just like kids would yeah yeah i love that and i love the memories of the football stadium the roller rink and hearing about the fountain um fountain, fountain like soda fountain shops I yeah think. so yeah just like you you see in what we now are the old time movies well that was the old time right then yeah for sure <laughs> i love it so can you tell us about your family farm and what the impact it has had on the Windsor community. As far as uh, the family farm started out as, as just the farm and then the, it evolved through the years and changed. It's just continually changed. When my dad passed away, mom wanted a vegetable garden and a vegetable stand. And she wanted one when she was a child and she'd ask her dad, Grandpa Lynn, if she could do a vegetable stand and he said no. And when she was a young married wife, dad said no. And so when dad passed away, a few years later, my brother called me and I wasn't living here, I was married and living elsewhere. And he, he said, mom wants to do a vegetable stand. What do you think? And I said, just do anything keeps mom happy. And so, the vegetable stand started and mom had pumpkins as well. And then more pumpkins. And then Kenny added chilies. And then a neighbor came by and told my brother, and I'm living in New Mexico at this time. And I echoed, said, you need to roast him. And he said, I'm not roasting any chilies. So the neighbor came by one day and dropped off a chili roaster. And that's one of that's the best chili roaster that we have out there. And so I started roasting chilies. So then when mom passed away, it was the three of us kids and mom said, please keep it a farm. So we've kept it a farm, but my sister and I are retired extension agents and we have other skills. Um, Ken is the farmer. So he does all of that. He's the partner, farmer partner. And my sister and I add our skills that we learned as extension agents and we do the marketing and the sales. And then we've added then events and we made it a goal to be an agritourism destination farm. And we are that now. Yeah. We are a destination farm. 
and people have made it a tradition to come out. Some have pictures every year taken of their family at the farm. Sometimes they're in shirts, same weekend. Sometimes they're in caps and winter coats. We never know what the weather is going to be like. And so I think the impact is that we still have a working farm for the community and for kids and families to come out and see and feel what it's like to be on a farm. And especially since Windsor has urbanized so much yeah. and um, there aren't a lot of farms that you can just go and visit and wander around, you know, pick a pumpkin out, but no pumpkins this year because of COVID. So, um, but other than that, this is the first year we haven't had pumpkins in over 35 years. So it's strange. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, and I love that you guys really preserve the legacy of your mom and your father by keeping the farm going and then adding that vegetable stand and kind of really maximizing that by having people come and make it a place that's a destination. That's amazing. Right. And then we also added to it, and my sister and I have added a gift shop so you can get jellies and jams and uh, you can get homemade things that we spend all winter making so that you won't find other places. And it's just uh, a lot of people that come in and say, oh my gosh, I've driven by here a hundred times. I had no idea. And it's kind of fun. It's quaint. We have gourds dried cords hanging on one side all from the ceiling. And uh, that just adds to the atmosphere. Of, this is a farm. This yeah. is a farm. Yeah. So, so how, I, I know Windsor experienced a pretty big event as far as the tornado goes. So how did that tornado affect uh, you and your family at the farm? At the farm, and at that time, my husband and I, we lived at in Windsor um, and my brother lived at the farm. My mom lived at the farm. Mom was in a modular home and mom was at the end of her life at that time. And we saw the tornado come over the bluff. And my oldest son works for FEMA and is, was a disaster agent for many years. And we know the direction that a tornado travels we knew the farm was right in line of the tornado, exactly where it would travel. But this tornado didn't do anything right. <laughs> and it turned and it went the wrong way. And, but while it was doing that, we were in the process of trying, Kenny, Kenny was helping mom to get from Roger home over to the farm to get in the basement. And I was running back and forth and I got prescriptions and medications and peanut butter, jelly, bread, a knife, and um, then went back and got, a, got her bedding. We figured out a bed for her down there, ran back and got, got a waste paper basket. I thought, well, you know what? We don't have a bathroom down here. So the waste paper basket would have been our bathroom as well if we needed it. And then it didn't show up and we saw that it went the other direction. And we told mom about it with her medication. She was really, you know, confused and everything. She says, I can't believe there's a tornado. So we had to pack her up another day and take her into Windsor to see the devastation that had happened and everything. And then she came home and that night she had a dream. And the next morning she said, you know, I had a dream last night. And she said, Kathy, you've always been resourceful. And she said, my dream is you went all over Windsor and you picked up all the trees and you started a toothpick factory. <laughs> so every time I come up with an idea for the farm, they say, are we doing another toothpick factory? <laughs> so <laughs> that didn't come to fruition, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Anyway, that, that, is, that is basically our tornado story in that um, we weren't harmed by it in any way, um, spared the farm completely. We have had twisters at the farm and just um, within the last five years, we had uh, woke up one morning with the, one of the grain bins over in the pumpkin patch. Uh, so the grain bins, all three of them came down because they were too dangerous for any 
public. And since we don't, we let people wander at the farm, we were afraid that, that the roof might come down and hurt somebody. So all the grain bins, the, the round ones uh, that you see at the farms, those are all gone. And uh, I have those pieces that I hope to work into my landscaping some way. But Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So I know I've got one more final question. So okay. Before we wrap up and then we'll go to everybody else's questions. But how do you, or what do you feel is the biggest change since you were a little child growing up um, in your in Bracewell community to now, and in Windsor, I mean, in the in the Bracewell and Windsor, um, I would say the biggest change, uh, especially Windsor, would be that it was a community where the people lived and worked within that community, um, and it was a very very farming town, and it was you would see sugar beet trucks more than you would see sports cars. Um, you then the Code Act when it came still retained that community working in the community type thing, and um, and to and the community also had a hospital, two of them here, and so there were a few of us in the forties that were born here and can say we are natives of this town. And that's something no one can say anymore is that they're a native of the town unless it happened to be a home birth, you know. And, um, but they, I think that now it is more of a commuting town and also the number of people that were the German background, I, that's not the majority of the people anymore, but the minority. So the culture, of the community has changed. Not for the bad or anything like that. It's just changed. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I have actually one more, maybe two more, so I'm sorry. Um, what advice then would you have? Because I, I feel like you came from such a, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but more of a, I, I always look at the past as being such a slower time and it wasn't like this rush around and we gotta go to work and we gotta do this, this, and this. and. I mean, maybe a lot of other people would agree, like we'd all love to kind of go back to that time where it was a slower time. So what advice do you have um, maybe regarding going back to a slowing time, slower time? Well, this might sound weird, but I'd say let's embrace COVID, embrace the good part of COVID. We see a lot of people that are coming out to the farm now that are actually preserving food again. Uh, putting up the tomatoes and uh, bringing good, good food to their their families and in ways that they're providing it and not just necessarily running to the, the hurry to the grocery store and grab something or uh, fast food and grab something, but they're learning to cook again and um, and make good meals and care about the nutrition of their family. And I think that is is one of the things that also that you can do something besides sit down and watch TV at night. Uh, you can do board games and you know you interact within the family. And so I think those are I think that is something my advice is that you know to not grumble about what has happened but embrace the good part of it and get through it. Love that. That actually leads me to my next question about the food. Is there a food that takes you back to your past that, that you remember from the farm? Is it a, a meal or a, one specific food item? Oh, sure. And uh, that would be probably the fact that we used to take gunny sacks, walk down the lane, mom would send us down there and we'd go down to the river. And uh, we, again, here we are kids with knives, but uh, <laughs> we would cut uh, wild asparagus and we would cut so much asparagus, we would fill a whole gunny sack full of asparagus. We don't have the wild asparagus down at the river uh, anymore, but um, I can remember going down there and just filling bags. And of course, then everybody in the neighborhood has asparagus for supper that night, you know. So uh, that's the one, one food that, you know, sticks in my memory that would be different than anything else now. So. 
thank you so much for sharing your story and just all of the history and memories and um, even just the passions that you have for Windsor and the Bracewell community. I, I so enjoyed being with you this evening and I'm sure everybody else has as well. So I definitely want to open it up to everybody. If you all have any questions that you'd like to ask Miss Kathy, we'd love to hear those. Well, thank you too. Yeah, you're welcome. You've got comments that this was amazing and what a story, I love it, from Polly. And then, um, although it's not related to Windsor, could you share your amazing Albuquerque balloon story, please? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well, when we went to Albuquerque, uh, of course, the balloon fiesta is awesome. Uh, it's just, you can't imagine. We have the balloons here and we think this is great, but if you could imagine that there's waves of 300 and another 300 and another 300 balloons. They're just wonderful, beautiful, and seeing them all in the sky. And so our last year when we were at Albuquerque, my kids uh, bought a ride for me in a balloon. And I was so excited and we loaded up and got in the balloon basket and left the field. We had more than gotten probably 10 feet up and they closed the field because the winds just came up boom like that. And you don't want to be in a balloon when the winds are blowing crazy. Well, we pilot still took us up because we couldn't get down. And so we went up and we were going across Albuquerque and he said, I need to get down. I need to get down. This wind is too high. And um, he said, anybody know where we could land? And I said, well, I'm from Albuquerque. I know where things are. And he said, okay, you can stand up because he made all of us sit down, squat down in the basket. And so I got up and I looked out and I said, well, you're gonna be coming up to the state fair. And the state fairgrounds has uh, the rodeo area, arena and so forth. Well, we went over that way too fast. He said, I can't bring it down there. There's too many fences, too many things, uh, can't do it. What's next? And I said, well, the Air Force Base is next. And he said, they do not let you land at the Air Force Base. And he said, but we're gonna land. He says, it's the only thing I can see right now. And so we came down and we came down and then the balloon drugged the basket. Uh, it went down sideways and it, the wind blew it and drew the basket and filled just full of dirt with us. And then it came back up and then it went back down. And there was a balloon following us and that balloon, they didn't clear the electrical line and it severed the basket and the basket fell and there was a woman that was in there was killed. My husband is at home watching TV and he's just sure I'm the woman that was killed. And I get home, open the door and it just about caused him to die because he <laughs> was so glad that it was me that came home. He was so scared. And uh, so it was an exciting first balloon ride. I'd do it again okay. because when we first lifted off, it was amazing, the peace and the quiet. It was just, but then all of a sudden, I just had a wind that came through. So, well, I'll be the next yeah. question if you'd ever do it again, so. Yeah. yeah, I'd do it again. I'd like to try and go back up again and just have a peaceful ride, not something so exciting. <laughs> so. Oh. oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you, Rochelle, for having her share that. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Based, uh, Dan said this chat was wonderful and thank you. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much, Miss Kathy. It was such a pleasure to be able to speak with you tonight and just learn so much more. And especially, you know, just getting that personal touch on the history of our communities, I think, is what we really need in our communities now, just even for our younger generations to learn more about. Um, what it means to live here and what the people that came before us experienced. So I'm so glad that you shared that with us. So thank you again so much. Thank you. And if we have no more questions, we're gonna um, end our chat tonight and we really hope to see you guys uh, 
October 1st. I can't keep track of dates because of COVID. I don't know if that's next week. I think so. Um, October 1st, 6.30 to 7.30. Again, it will be Dennis Kane, and we'll be looking forward to chatting with him. So thank you all again so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. I will. And you too.